Welcome to How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships from True Story FM. Today, what do you do with a tiny, wounded, narcissistic toaster? Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm Seth Nelson. As always, I'm here with my good friend, Pete Wright. Today on the show, it's all about narcissism. How do you help yourself working through narcissistic abuse? What do you have to learn about yourself when it comes to your own relationship choices? This week, the fix is in. Sherry Gaba is a licensed psychotherapist, life coach, author of Love Smacked, How to Stop the Cycle of Relationship Addiction and Codependency to Find Everlasting Love. Carla Romo is the author of Contagious Love, speaker and a certified life coach specializing in dating and relationships. Together, they host the fantastic Love Fix podcast, and they're here today to share what they've learned about these damaging relationships. Carla and Sherry, welcome to the toaster. Yay. Thank you. I love that. Woohoo. Thanks for having us. Pete, I think that's our first ever woohoo. That's the first woohoo. And we got it (laughs) when talking about narcissism. You just had to bring the Love Fix on, you know? (laughs) And I I love the narcissistic toaster. That's that's. Hot. That's the only type of toaster I get at the store. Literally. <laughs> I'll tell you, you know what? So I, I've, I've been listening to Love Fix, awesome show. And uh, I, you have obviously done your fair share of podcasts on narcissism. And I was looking at our last, you know, eight seasons of shows. We've done some topics on narcissism. And by far and away, our most downloaded episodes are on narcissism why are you nodding your heads too we're broken as as <laughs> organisms what is happening right now well i don't know sherry and i always talk about this of like with the whole like narcissistic abuse or narcissism is such a buzzword where only what like like less than one percent of the population are actual narcissists if you if you look it up right and so i i mean sherry you always talk about like since the you know a presidential election that happened years ago, um, you know, it's become such a buzzword. It just started trickling down. And we got to be careful, right? Because as a clinical therapist, not everybody is a narcissist. There's a lot of people that have the traits of being a narcissist, but not necessarily a narcissist. Well, that's begging the question right there, right, Pete? Please, Seth, yeah. (laughs) How can you have traits and not be one? So to be one, you have to actually have no empathy whatsoever. A true narcissist is wired differently than the rest of us. And that that's the hardest part for someone who's in a relationship with a narcissist to get. Like, why doesn't he get it? Why don't I get that validation I need? Why is he not understanding me and knowing me? It's because his brain is not wired correctly. He It's wired differently. He has no, or he or she, I will not just say he, <laughs> but being a female here, I'm saying he, but um, the he or she, the he or she, the he or she, they don't. You can um, just blame it on the men. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) The he or or she in this situation. We're doing great. You know what? Pronouns hurt everybody right now in our brains. It's rewiring. Just blame it on the men. (laughs) We can take it. My wife bashes the male race all the time. I got lots of points by never defending the male race. I just say, but there's exceptions to the rules, you know. (laughs) <laughs> women can be narcissists. Absolutely. Women can be narcissists. And, and we get called on that all the time if we accidentally post something that doesn't say such. But they can't understand you. They don't know what you're saying. They don't get it. They just have no empathy whatsoever. That's a true personality disorder of a narcissist. So is there a study that is out there that might prove that marriage causes narcissism? Because... <laughs> Everyone says, I got married, I was happy, and then they turned into a narcissist. Now they're a monster. Okay, no, nobody can just turn into a narcissist. You're pretty much like, I mean, people can develop narcissistic personality disorder, but the problem is, is that narcissists do a really great job in the beginning of love bombing. So they tell you how amazing you are. They've never felt this way. You know, there might be some covert or overt narcissism, especially if it's a covert narcissist, you don't really like see the signs really of what's going on. And then 
eventually something can start to, tri- you know, well, <laughs> the personality disorder starts to get triggered in that person. And then they, you know, somebody starts to really see it and it can progressively get worse and worse. Yeah, we got to, but Carla, you got to help me here because I, I want, uh, like in terms of just setting the table for the conversation, somebody's listening to the show and is like, no, I'm not like, I, I don't, how do you be a covert narcissist? What is that? What does that even look like? Because I feel like that's the emotional entrapment piece that you're talking about, right? Yeah, it's insidious manipulation. It's gaslighting. It's saying one thing and meaning something else. It's like under the radar. It's passive aggressiveness. But it isn't like this crazy, you know, verbal abuse necessarily. I mean, it's emotional abuse, but it may not be name calling. But it's all that stuff underneath, like the holidays are coming. And all of a sudden, they're sick during the holidays. They're they're ruining the holidays. Things that you wouldn't even think about. And Carla's right. They start out, you know, it's fast and furious, love bombing. You think you have this amazing person and you keep wanting to go back to that person. You keep wanting that person that you first met. And that's what makes it so crazy. Sherry, what are some signs, red flags that might be occurring that people won't notice? Like, for example, being sick on the holidays, that would not have been on my list. Well, it's passive aggressive stuff. It's coming around. It's like coming around the bend, right? It's not being upfront and honest. It's very manipulative. I actually share. I really like your sick on the holidays because I'm like, Seth, I didn't think about that. But really, the, isn't that the form of manipulation? It's maybe not that you're sick on a holiday, but when you're sick on a lot of holidays, all that's doing is bringing the attention back to you. Right. In a time when it should be shared. That's the manipulation part of it to me. And that's the narcissistic piece because it is all about them. And the other piece, too, when Sherry talks about like the lying or whatever, like you can think that your partner, you guys are having these conversations and everything is, you know, you guys are on the same page. It's everything's good. It's moving forward. And then you find out that they're, you know, cheating or and this, you know, sure, there's lots of infidelity that happens in marriages and whatnot. But in terms of like the narcissist, right, is really lying and living this separate life behind your back. And that also like you wouldn't know because you're just thinking, oh, they're on a work trip or they're going, they're staying out late for drinks with coworkers or whatever. But they're kind of also living this other life behind your back as well and doing all the manipulation around it. You know, things like saying to someone, you know, do you really like your hair that way? Rather than saying your hair looks like shit. Like, <laughs> do you think that you're, that's a great hairstyle for you? I don't know any guy that's ever looked at his wife or girlfriend and said your hair <laughs> looks like shit. I mean, <laughs> they might as well say, yep. I don't want to get laid for a year. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I will say this, though. Narcissists will do anything and everything to tear somebody down. So, so there are people that say shit like that. They do say, like, I mean, I had someone say to me, you know, do you, have you had to blow dry your hair? I mean, listen, I live in Florida. My hair is a frizzball. You know, it just <laughs> is. How to I blow mean, dry your so, hair? Yeah, did you ever learn? I mean, or did you ever, or how about you're trying to clean the sink? Have, um, who taught you how to clean? Did you, did you know that when you, you know, clean a seat, you, you kind of open up the paper towel and you go like, you know, you, well, no one can see me, but you don't go in circles. You go like, it's very, very insidious, but it starts to like wear at you. All I know now, Sherry, is our listeners are going to be like, I'm going to be checking out what happens on Flag Day. If this guy's sick on Flag Day <laughs> with these holidays. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to be looking Ground at, at, day. at, at, at day. what I'm doing on, on Arbor day. cleaning the sink and see what he says. Always you know, I might open use a sponge, not a paper towel, towel and just uh-huh. move the germs around. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. We're here. doing the Lord's work here on the Toaster podcast right now. I'm telling you that. It's happening. Uh, OK, I, this is this gets to I think share your that that point. Like, what is it that defines the manipulation? It's that insidiousness. But again, Carla said something earlier that really piqued my interest that you can develop narcissistic personality disorder. When do people become narcissists like? How does are they narcissists at, you know, is is there like a nine year old narcissist out there who needs to be interviewed on a podcast? I mean, I, I tend to disagree with Carla just on that one point. I mean, I think you're born with a personality disorder and it, I, I think you see those things in children, you know, the ones that are 
doing terrible things to animals. I saw the bad seed. Jodie Foster tried to kill her mom. Okay. <laughs> I did it all right. This is, uh... I, I didn't know that, but... Didn't know about that either. I'm telling you. I feel like is that something I should be Googling? You guys, I just added a movie to your movie list. Look at that. You're welcome. There you go. There you go. There's the movie. You know, kids that are super entitled. But this is the whole nature versus nurture argument, right? We interviewed somebody on our podcast, the Love Fix podcast, where the woman said that if a if a child experiences a big enough trauma, that can cause narcissism. That's where I, you know, pick up the yes, somebody could be born it, but like you can also have a significant trauma happen at a very young age. And as a result, that can make somebody also a narcissist. Right. You're, you're correct. You're correct. I mean, think of this, but the, the narcissist usually has major abandonment issues. Someone has left. There's been a lot, you know, the mother's left, the father's left. There's been parentification where the child's made to feel like a little parent, like a little adult. These are the big trauma pieces that create a narcissist. Okay. There's a fun thing too with this. If anybody likes Halloween stuff, Narcissists are also psychopaths. So psychopaths are like the overarching umbrella. And then underneath psychopath, there's different divisions of it. And narcissist is one of those that falls under it. I feel like I see them dressed on Halloween all the time because they look like everyone else. Hey. <laughs> well, this year, they'll all be Barbie and Ken. So is Ken a narcissist? He could be. I don't He's know. just Ken, Sherry. He's just Ken. Hi, Hi Barbie. Barbie. <laughs> Hi, Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> talk about dating a narcissist or being married to one and, and what does that look like and how do you get yourself out of that and evaluate your own relationship choices? Well, the dating part, so I'll, I'll give you some red flags. They start out, like we talked about earlier, love bombing, lavishing you with these amazing gifts, making you feel so special. And often codependents or people with low self-esteem are attracted to a narcissist because they want that attention. They thrive on that attention. So it feels so good to them. You know, the narcissist is saying things like, I love everything about you. I've never met anyone as perfect as you. You're the only person I want to spend time with. And so you're just soaking that in. That's part of the beginning of a narcissistic dating uh, relationship. You know, controlling behaviors. They want your un undivided attention. They don't want you to have friends. They're isolating you. I mean, I went out with one person. Um, I invited them to go to lunch with some other friends of mine. And this person was like, why did you invite these other people? This is my turn time with you. I came all the way out here to, to, to be with you. Why are these other people here? They're very, you know, insecure. They project back onto you their own insecurities. They want to make you feel insecure so they can be up here and you can be down below here. They also probably talk about their exes too, in a way that makes it so it's used as manipulation. Oh, I couldn't stand when my ex used to do this or used to do that. So then you feel like, oh gosh, I can't do that. I don't want to be like the ex. I want to, right? Because you already have such low self-esteem around it at this point, or your self-esteem is dwindling because of them. Yeah. So it's also like talking poorly about exes. That's a huge red flag. Or, you know, oh, my, you know, divorce, it was all her fault or, you know, whatever his fault, uh, whatever, you know, going on there too. And one of the big telltale signs is boundaries. As soon as you try to set a boundary, they're like not going to have it. Yeah. Like you cannot set a boundary. They're going to get very angry, very rageful. And then finally, just looking at yourself, are you giving up parts of yourself? Are you losing parts of yourself? Are you no longer taking care of yourself? Have you lost your self-care habits? You know, you're not going to the gym anymore. You're not getting together with your friends. You're literally trying to turn yourself in a pretzel to this for this person, for them to love you. And I like that one probably the best because it's totally internal looking. And you know how you were before being in this relationship and you can compare and contrast that to how you are now. So you don't have to be like, well, giving him the benefit of the doubt. He was just wanting to spend time with me, like making the excuses to kind of smooth over what might be red flags, um, mixing metaphors there. But if you look at yourself, you can certainly say, yeah, I'm not going to the gym as much. What's going on there? Right. The question that comes to mind, though, is like, what does it take to learn that? Because it seems to me like when you start talking about some of the insidious digs, the things that start to shape your behavior as a result of this relationship, what are the long term impacts of being in a relationship with a narcissist on you? Right. Because I imagine it's pretty easy 
to get lost in the changes that have been made to your own behavior before you even recognize it happened. Yeah. And and that's actually something that's really big. Your friends or family or even coworkers that know you well will notice these changes before you probably do yourself. They'll start to maybe say, hey, I'm concerned or this seems weird. You start to make excuses for them because it's part of the denial process, right? Of like what they were, what their potential is, or you're so afraid if there's codependency and things like that or self esteem at stake that you're so afraid of being alone that you're like, I'm willing to do anything to salvage this. However, you know, when you get to that point, it's loss of self, low self esteem, no confidence. Um, you're second guessing yourself, isolation from friends and family, not making choices for yourself zero boundaries, any type of hobbies or interests are just kind of thrown out the door. I mean, this is like really like the the bottom of it. You might even be physically ill. You know, that can also happen, the stress. Yeah, PTSD. Most people that have been in narcissistically abusive relationships have PTSD. I mean, PTSD isn't just from, you know, a tsunami or a divorce or earthquake. I mean, you can actually get PTSD by being abused, of course. Of course. Yeah. Well, let's let's talk about the flip side of being in a relationship with somebody and that's getting out of a relationship with a narcissist. Right. How do you how do you get out of it? How do you excise yourself from a relationship? And, you know, in, in our case, divorce, that has to be, it seems to me, a very threatening loss of control for the narcissist. And it is. <laughs> yeah. All right, that's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs> we won the podcast. Yeah. Yeah, we'll fix Ta-da. it in post-production. Yeah, right. That's what Andy always <laughs> right, says. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, that is the worst when you abandon them. That's And then the, what they're going to do is the thing you have to watch out for is the hoovering techniques. Okay, what is hoovering? They're going to try to start sucking you in again. They're going to go back to what they were doing in the beginning, the love bombing. So you being with the narcissist, oh my God, they're... They're acting like they were when I first met them. Oh, I love this. They're sending flowers. They're doing all that. Oh, he's back. He's come. The crazy making is the trauma bond that is created when you're with a narcissist. You have now, you're addicted to the up and down. And now they're suddenly throwing you a bone or throwing you a carrot. And now you're like, oh, he's back. So you got to be really careful of that. That's why they talk about no contact. You don't want, if you really want to leave this person and you know this is a really unhealthy relationship, you must go no contact. If you have children, of course, and you can probably talk about this, Pete and Seth, co-parenting stuff is a little different, but there are techniques, even when you're co-parenting, not to have to have as little contact as possible with the narcissist. Well, that's the thing in a divorce that it makes it harder than if you're not married Yeah, is, you know, if you're not married, Hopefully you can get your shit and leave, right? If you're not on the lease, you move out. Right. You just block them on social media. You do what you can not to have any contact. Absolutely. If you have to get a divorce, there is going to be contact one way or the other. Because if you're in court, they'll be sitting there. If there's a deposition, they'll be sitting there. If they're at a mediation... They'll be in the building. They might be in another room, but they're there. That's the problem that happens in divorce. And if you are communicating with them, they will use that fear in trying to gaslight you and change the topic of, if you do this, you'll have nothing. I'll kick you out on the street. You'll have no money. They will tell you what they want to say about the outcome of the case to get what they want, not because it's true. They will also tell you that anybody else other than them is does not have your best interest at heart. Oh, that lawyer is just saying that to run up fees. That lawyer doesn't care about you and doesn't, you know, have our kids' interest at hand. That lawyer has 30 cases. How could they possibly care? Right? They just go on and on and on, and that causes problem after problem. That's why you have to limit the discussions with them. I mean, if you're not just talking about when are the kids, you know, your son coming over, your daughter's coming over, what? why do you have to have these long, you don't have to justify, you don't have to explain, you don't have to defend, you don't have to have these conversations. Just talk about 
custody stuff. I mean, I don't know. You're more the expert in that area. Well, and, and this was my question. We've talked about parallel parenting a lot, which seems like the strategy for dealing with a narcissist, but also the impossible to do with a narcissist. Right? And I'm wondering, Seth, how these things, how these these relate. Like, is there is this a high jump, low ceiling kind of a matchup when we're talking about no contact and parallel parenting? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. It's very, very difficult especially if you're in litigation, because one of the things in Florida, check your local jurisdiction, is do you have a united front when it comes to the children? How do you do that if you're not communicating, (laughs) right? So they're like, well, I have to talk to them because the court's looking at whether I talk to them. I'm bending over backwards, and they go on and on and on. But talk to them with one of those. um... Yeah, our family wizard, talking parents. We've talked about some other ones. So you can have it, but there's still that communication. And one of the things that we've talked about at Pete that I work with my clients on and we do here at NLG is that we will help teach our clients how to communicate more effectively with their soon-to-be ex-spouse or current or they're already ex spouse like whatever it is, so we can get through all the crazy, in quotes, and get to the issues. And when an email or communication through these apps and online platforms come through, and it's just white noise, you just don't respond. You say, thank you for your, your information. You don't engage. You don't engage. You try to keep it really short. Um, you can have a you know a separate email address, a separate phone, just for the X, so you're not constantly being bombarded by emails. I mean, they have to know that this will be a special email, special uh, cell phone, so I don't have to hear from you all the time. <laughs> I'm only going to hear from you over here, so I can have my regular life over here. Because otherwise, you're going to constantly be triggered. Well, and that, that's that's it, right? And you know, it, it feels like when I'm thinking about what would be triggering behavior to a narcissist, it would be you're taking actions to limit, to put a wall up around the communication that is allowed from somebody who just wants to have all the communication and have it be all about them. So, Carla, I got a question for you on this about what Pete's talking about. Is doing that kind of triggering them, and I'm not defending them, but if narcissists can come about from abandonment and now we're abandoning that they now get triggered but ultimately you have to protect yourself. Is that, do I have that right, Carla? Yes. So here's the thing. I actually always like to make this point. If if there's been domestic violence going on, the most dangerous time to leave it was is to leave in the relationship, right? Whether that's, you know, you're deciding to get divorced or you're literally coming up with a plan with hopefully a therapist or a friend who can help you literally escape your situation, you know, because of that trigger, right? They try to control. I mean, you can look at statistics speaking of like, murder rates that happen because after somebody has left a domestic violence situation, and a lot of times that's due to narcissism. But I will say this, you cannot control the narcissist. There is nothing you can or can't do. Like, you have to look out for yourself. So their trigger is going to be their trigger. And what you need to do is have boundaries and safety protocols in place in case it gets out of hand or gets out of control. And that's how you protect yourself. So yes, pulling away in the sense of not answering or blocking them and doing things like that is going to spiral them. Yeah, 100%. But that's because they already have that. It's not a doing of your own, right? Like you've got to protect yourself and look out for you. Like I said, having the safety protocols, having people you trust there uh, to help you through it is going to be key. All right. We'll be right back after this message from our sponsor. Seth, according to the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, about 10% of children live with a parent with an alcohol use disorder. It's just tragic. Pete, we hear this statistic all the time. At the end of the day, the courts don't care about the statistic. The courts care about keeping kids safe. And when I mean safe, I mean safe from a party who truly suffers from an alcohol disorder or is being wrongly accused of having alcoholism or some other alcohol disorder. It's easy, and it saves you money. Instead of he said, she said, 
There's Soberlink. Soberlink is fantastic, and they are a fantastic partner to this show. So what is Soberlink? Soberlink is a device. It's like a breathalyzer, but it is more. You blow into Soberlink whenever you want to prove in real time that you are safe to be with your kids at carpool, at drop-off, at handoff. Whenever you're going to be driving, you blow into Soberlink. It uses facial recognition to prove that you were the one blowing at the time that you are taking the reading. It sends it off to the people who need to know, people involved directly in your case, not to be used for publication, not to be used for social media. This just goes to the people who matter most for your case as you are collecting data. Soberlink Remote Alcohol Monitoring has helped over 500,000 people prove their sobriety and provide peace of mind during parenting time. And Seth, word on the street is courts love it. Yeah. And it's not just when you're getting in a car. Let's be clear. People can say, never gotten a DUI. What's the issue? Well, the issue is once you're home at five o'clock and you're no longer driving, but you're going to start cooking and having a glass of wine and that glass of wine turns into two bottles. That's now an issue. So it's not just getting in the car. It's when you, the children are in your care, custody and control, are you focused on them and not using alcohol? Independent third party, real time verification to support your case. I haven't been drinking Here's the proof. Those are the words that lawyers and courts love, but here are the words you're going to love. You can save 50 bucks off your device and get started right away at Soberlink.com slash toaster. That's Soberlink.com slash toaster. Thank you to Soberlink for sponsoring this show. It seems like what you're talking about is sort of the start, like the step one on recovery from being in a relationship with a narcissistic personality. Say you get all that action in order, right? You get all of your your ducks in a row and you admit to the fact that, you know, you've, you've been in a relationship with a narcissist and now you need to move on. You've got the burner phone. You've got all the things you need. What does it look like to make yourself whole again? after a relationship like this? Well, I always talk about self-love because this, you know, saying you might have heard before, but it's true. Like the most important relationship you're ever going to have is the relationship with yourself. And self-love is a complete journey. And so it's starting to really build up yourself again and what that looks like. And it's a journey, right? So it's not just like a quick fix. There's not just like a magic program that you can buy and boom, like everything's great again. But, you know, it can start with, getting help, going to somebody like Sherry, who's a, you know, a a psychotherapist who's licensed, working through the trauma, hiring a coach to start building out your life again in terms of how you define self-care. What are your interests? You know, back in the gym, working out all those things you gave up. Yes. All of that. Yeah. Finding yourself. And often you're probably a codependent. So you can find some 12 step meetings on codependency, like looking at why do I keep getting into these relationships? Why do I keep thinking I can fix, manipulate and change someone? Why do people do that? We all do it. Why do we do that? It starts in childhood. You know, if you felt invisible, if you felt like if you were neglected or abused or abandoned, you're going to end up being attracted to that kind of person. Not always. I mean, anybody can bump into a narcissist. You can have you know, some of the most successful people in the world can end up with a narcissist, but often it's usually because you felt invisible. You didn't know what your preferences were. You don't know what you want. And so then you meet someone and it looks all good on the outside. You're attracted to what you know. If you've been hurt, you know, growing up, neglected, like I said, abandoned, had parents who were addicts, alcoholics, that's what you're usually going to be attracted to. So you got to start learning how to be attracted to not the fast and furious, not the crazy bad boy, bad girl, which is a whole other topic in and of itself. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I was like, I felt like you just opened up a can of worms on that yeah, one. Yeah, that's right. Carla right, right, started right. laughing. Pete's eyes like lit up. <laughs> like, here we go. <laughs> you yeah. you got to look around if you're you, Seth, and wonder if somebody said bad boy and they're all laughing. Maybe they're talking about me. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Because right? that's what, when they see me, that's what people think, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh oh, watch out. It's Seth and Pete again. (laughs) There you go. Like with our motorcycles. Right. You know, not to stereotype anybody, you know. Oh, my God. We got a lot. We got a lot of that in Central Florida. Well, I was going to say now the the bad boy type is uh, like, you know, Instagram has a lot of like, you know, 
okay, I'm about to go into a whole other subject, but it follows all the like, you know, women on Instagram and is liking all their photos. And then like, you know, totally is like posting all photos of himself and how cool he is. You know, that's, that's the, the modern bad boy. The modern day bad boy. Instagram okay. bad boy. <laughs> that, what you just described to me, maybe it's just because I'm old. That just sounded exhausting. Uh, it's totally exhausting. <laughs> well, God, me too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, what? God. Who's got, how do I get that done before I get in bed at eight o'clock? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as this uh, episode uh, drops, uh, we have just passed the high holy days of my birthday, but that's not what I want to talk about. What I really want to talk about is uh, holidays as we get to wrapping up. Holidays are hard. I'm I'm curious in your experience and what you've learned over the years of talking about it on your podcast. What's triggering for the narcissist in the holidays, especially if, as you uh, are on the, the far side of a relationship? It's not about you. It's, it's about the kids. It's about having a party. It's you're busy, you know, how holidays are. You're stressed out. You're no longer getting all the attention, meaning the narcissist. Yeah. That is the biggest trigger. So is like that family time, like you're, you're going to the Thanksgiving table and dinner, like does a narcissist hate that because it's about everyone else other than them or everyone collectively? Yes. Yeah. Because if, if you've been in a relationship or married to a narcissist, think back to your holidays. Think back to your, even your, your vacations. At some point, I bet there was some kind of blowout fight or something big that happened because it was no longer about them. And it was, you know, they got upset and the focus wasn't on them. So they needed to do, throw their fit or whatever to like have everybody look at them and the attention was on them because nobody else could be happy. Right. Like it's not, you know, the narcissist doesn't actually care about being with the family. The narcissist cares about being the center of the tension. Hmm. And they're moody. They're so moody. Like they could be excited for the vacation and you're driving and you're holding hands and then you walk into the hotel and they like throw a fit because, you know, it's not the room that they thought they were going to have. I mean, they're so unpredictable. It's crazy making that. And that, again, is the trauma bond. And that's what keeps you stuck. Because you keep hoping for that honeymoon phase again. You keep hoping for them to be sweet and charming. They're off. They're awfully charming. Like ask anybody who's been with a narcissist. They're so charming until they're not. Until they're right, right up to that point. Yeah. I because Carla brought it up, and because uh, I'm feeling old too. How do narcissists use and manipulate social media? What do you need to be looking out for if you're in a relationship with the? Uh with a social media narcissist. Okay, I'm just going to use this as an example. Anybody that you see who looks like they have the perfect life and perfect family and relationship on social media is probably hiding something. Like there's probably more to it. Now, if things seem genuine and like great, okay. But like when you see certain like posts and like they, there's like all these like comments and it's like this whole like facade really that's going on. So a lot of times people who are with narcissists. The narcissist wants everything to look perfect on the outside. So, you know, they might post pictures of their partner and make them seem like the hero. Like, oh, I found this perfect person. Then they're getting all the praise. Wow, you you really are so amazing. I'm so happy for you, right? Their partner is this like little like toy, right? Like figure that's like kind of like touted, you know, like, hey, like look at me. Like I've, I've got a trophy here in that sense. Or also another way is that you know, this person is cheating on you in some kind of capacity, you know, starting out emotionally on social media, DMing other women, getting on dating apps while, you know, the other person is in. And and like I said, this doesn't have to be a narcissist. There's lots of infidelity and things like that that go on in relationships. But these are some pretty big signs, you know, using dating apps as a way to like meet people, talk to people, you know, have affairs while also being in a relationship. Remember, the narcissist needs narcissistic supply. They need attention. So when you start figuring out who they are and they realize, uh oh, I've, ca- I've been caught. They know that, I, you know, she knows now they're going to start looking for attention elsewhere. And so Carla's absolutely right. They're going to start going on social media apps. You may not even be like, necessarily cheating physically, but they're looking for attention wherever they can get it. Or like, you know, liking like if if, this is also another sign if you're on Instagram and like somebody who's got a like a partner or wife, whatever, is always liking and commenting your stuff on your stuff. Like that's that's odd. There's something odd there. Right. And so that person wants that attention. I'm not saying they're a narcissist, but like that can be narcissistic behaviors. I cannot tell you how much I love narcissistic supply. 
that term <laughs> framed everything for me. Like attention that, whore. It's is what it right. Is. <laughs> totally. To- you got to get your fix. Like you've got to. You got to figure out where your next where your next hit's coming from. My dog must need narcissistic supply. My dog needs so much attention. She yeah. just needs so much petting and loving. I never thought of that. Yeah, my dog dogs be are a narcissist. Dogs are narcissists. They're totally narcissists. So here's the thing: I'm a little confused about, and I will confess, admit, acknowledge any one of those words you want to pick is Carla, a lot of stuff that you just described. I always think that everyone life feels like they have a great Facebook life. Everything's wonderful and great. Like no one's, some people post like bad things that happen, but and people are liking shit all the time. And I'm like, why do you like that? And they're like, Oh, and then they tell me something that I don't really listen to. So it's the motive, <laughs> it's the motive for posting that you want to look out for. Right? Like, what's the motive for somebody posting? Sure, everybody likes validation. That's like what social media does. People go there, whatever. But a lot of times, narcissists will make it look like they curate an image, right? The motive is that we have this perfect life. Look how amazing I am as a husband or as a wife or as a partner or whatever. And they post things to get that validation. And so does and so does the partner though. So does I mean we have to. Well, that's you know, the thing. The that's, person yes. with the narcissist has to has to kind of own their part. Like they they know they have a crappy relationship, but I'm going to look good. I'm going to post on Facebook. Things are great, you know. Meanwhile, they're miserable, but they want everything to look good as well. Be- because this is actually interesting because I've used this in court before and it's now fallen on deaf ears with the judges. And I think this has a lot to do with the arc of social media and how our society changes. And I'll give you another example as well. At first, like people would bash like my client in court and I'd be like, look at what you're saying to the world on social media, how wonderful and great they are. And now judges are like, yeah, that's bullshit. Everyone, like everyone says great things on social media. So that argument kind of fails a little bit now because it we're just attuned to it. We almost know that it's a bullshit life that people are posting. <laughs> and another example that I had a long time ago when I was trying cases, the father did not have a landline. And I made a big deal in court about, well, how did you, your kid going to, Dial 911. Where do you put your cell phone in the middle of the night? Up on the nightstand. Is it always in the same space? Did you tell him where it is? Oh my God, he can't reach the top of the dresser. Like that doesn't fly in court anymore because no one has landlines. Yeah, right, right. Right. So it's just how things change. And, and I've seen that in social media where I think a lot of people don't believe what's posted. Fascinating. Well, and I think that's what one of the things that's so interesting is a, as an outcome of that is it lets the narcissists hide. Yeah. Right. Because we're all doing it in some way, shape or form. And that's why these red flags are so important. Right. That's why, you know, looking at patterns of posting and liking and and the way those patterns take shape over time are, are so interesting because we're all it's all just another mask. You know, Seth, I have to say, it actually feels really good that people people are seeing past the bullshit on social media because I, I mean, I see past it, right? I look at this and I'm like, and like, I don't know if that's because I do a lot of work with people, right? In regards to like insecurities and what's really going on in people's lives. And they're not going to just post that. They're going to talk about it in a coaching session, but they're not just going to post about it. But I, I would, I think it's good that people can see through that, you know, whereas I don't know if everybody does though. Yeah, I don't know. We call it here in the office. Oh, they have a great Facebook life. <laughs> I love oh, it. That's funny. <laughs> that's really great. Right. But I mean, we talk, it's a, like we say it on a Thursday. Like it is, like, yep. you know, and like, oh, I got a potential client. Yeah, I, I know that person. And yeah, they have a great Facebook life. But down beneath, we, we, we see what's going on and we only see the tip of that iceberg, right? Of what's really happening underneath that water is not always very good. Yeah. Wow. Uh, you guys uh, are fantastic. Thank you. You guys are awesome. Thank you for having us. Well, tell us where, where do we, you, you both are doing so much stuff. Each of you are doing so much stuff. Uh, I don't even know. I almost feel like I should make it a game, like let you guess what the other wants to plug, or do you just want to plug the show? I'm going to let you go for it. Carla, where do you want to send people to hear about your stuff? Go to thelovefix.com. That's thelovefix.com. We've got a group coaching program. We also have a really awesome freebie, which is Are My Relationships Healthy? It's a quiz. 
And uh, with that quiz, there's also a workbook that goes along with it. And then our podcast is out everywhere. The Love Fix, you can listen anywhere. Yeah, we're just going to promote the Love Fix today. Yeah. Well, look at you guys. It's fantastic. Well, I'll tell you what. We're going to put the links to all of your stuff. Yeah, Pete, yeah. that's the tip of the iceberg. Tip, right? Yeah. That's the tip now, of the iceberg. Now, there's a lot of shit going on elsewhere. <laughs> so it's not bad, on. though. It's not bad. <laughs> it's, okay. it's not bad. It's all good. Well, I mean, look up. Yeah, if you want to look up our saying. names, you know, yeah. that's fine. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Sherry's got an awesome, awesome website. She does you know, therapy and coaching. And I, I do coaching, um, you know, with clients as well. So you guys can find us individually as well, but check out the love fix. Cause we got an awesome, uh, coaching program there. Sure do. And the podcast is great. Subscribe, uh, show Carla and Sherry some love Thank there. You. Thank you guys so much for hanging out. Thank you everybody for downloading and listening to this fair show. We sure appreciate your time and your attention. And don't forget, you can ask a question. If you want to get our quest- your questions in on the show for Seth or our guests, uh, just head over to howtosplittotoaster.com. Hit the uh, submit a question button. It's right there. It'll come to us. We'll talk about you on the show. We sure appreciate that on behalf of Sherry Gaba and Carla Romo of the Love Fix podcast and Seth Nelson, America's favorite divorce attorney. I'm Pete Wright, and we'll see you next week right here on How to Split a Toaster, the divorce podcast about saving your relationships. How to Split a Toaster is part of the True Story FM podcast network, produced by Andy Nelson, music by T. Bless and the Professionals and DB Studios. Seth Nelson is an attorney with NLG Divorce and Family Law with offices in Tampa, Florida. While we may be discussing family law topics, How to Split a Toaster is not intended to, nor is it providing legal advice. Every situation is different. If you have specific questions regarding your situation, please seek your own legal counsel with an attorney licensed to practice law in your jurisdiction. Pete Wright is not an attorney or employee of NLG Divorce and Family Law. Seth Nelson is licensed to practice law in Florida.